Wonderful. So welcome, folks. Thank you so much for taking time out of your lovely spring weather to come and uh, join us for this presentation that I'm calling Grow Your Own, where we're going to talk about food production in your home and your yard. And um, my name is Patty Love. I um, come to you uh, as uh, someone who um, worked in my family's vegetable garden from a very young age. We have a large garden and we put away a lot of food each year to feed our family of six um, with freezing and canning and um, those sorts of things. So I've been growing food a good part of my life. And then about 11 years ago, um, I studied uh, a set of techniques called permaculture, which I'll explain that word in just a few slides. Um, so I'm a certified permaculture designer and teacher, and I work uh, with folks in the area and out of the area, um, helping uh, people create food forest gardens and pollinator gardens, um, lots of different ways to help, help folks um, get some food growing in their own uh, spaces, and I'll show you some things from some of my spaces. So let's see, we'll get this, get the show on the road here. So tonight I'm hoping we have a little fun while we're learning and that you'll learn at least one thing. Um, I'm going to introduce this con concept, this word uh, permaculture that I used. We're going to talk about how to grow more healthy food in less space and how to do that with less weeding and watering. And I'll show you some examples that I hope that are inspiring. And, um, and then we'll save time for questions. I'll present for no more than an hour and then we'll have up to a half hour for questions. So with that, uh, you'll hear me say homesteading sometimes, just to clarify that term. Uh, homesteading is a self-sufficient lifestyle that's not um, dependent on, on your location. Um, oops. <laughs> and well, there we go. <laughs> uh, and in homesteading, sometimes we are growing food that we're eating fresh in season and also preserving uh, food for consumption during the winter months. Um, we also, in homesteading, we might be working from our home and either making a craft or um, writing books, or uh, in my case, I also do a lot of um, you know, designing work right from my home office. So homesteading is this combination of trying to provide for ourselves from our homes, no matter what our home uh, looks like or where it is. And when we are homesteaders, um, where we're producing some, uh, some of our own food, uh, not only are we becoming less of a consumer and more of a producer, we're also uh, hopefully growing our food in ways that are uh, environmentally friendly. Uh, we're also not you know, driving to a grocery store to buy food. Uh, it can also be a really more flexible and, and family-oriented lifestyle. And it helps us really uh, like where we live and, and really want to spend time in our home. Um, so for me, those are all things that, uh, that I like uh, about homesteading. I do want to acknowledge that the homesteading that I do is on the uh, stolen lands of the Haudenosaunee people, uh, who were the first people uh, to live in this area for generations and generations and generations, um, and especially the Onondaga uh, in the place where I um, now live, in, uh, in the place called Rochester um, in West Brighton. I live over along uh, Black Creek near Genesee, I'm sorry, Red Creek, near Genesee Park. Uh, just to explain a little bit about this term you've heard me use, uh, permaculture, I define it as a holistic design approach that's based in the, um, the ways that indigenous people steward the land and also how nature um, develops relationships 
uh, among the beings, the food chain, the, um, all of the interconnections that exist in nature. And this is a very uh, regenerative and ecological design, of course. I mean, nature um, really is perfect ultimately in the way that when we learn from nature and use these practices, we're not only caring for people and providing for our needs, we're also taking care of the needs of the insects and the trees and the plants, the fungi, all of the beings on the planet. Um, instead of using permaculture, which uh, is a term that uh, not everyone will be familiar with, we could think of this as sustainable uh, design or systems thinking, ecological design, uh, regenerative design. That's all the similar enough terms for what we're doing. We're talking about how we do what we do every day. And thinking about how we're caring for the earth, how we're caring for people and um, how we're sharing our resources. So if any of you are already gardeners or live next door to a gardener, uh, you may find zucchini or tomatoes on your doorstep in, uh, in the hot days of summer. That's an example of um, the resource share ethic. Also, as we're working like nature with nature, we can't help but notice that everything is connected. Uh, we know that, for example, the decline in, in uh, milkweed has caused a decline in the monarch butterfly um, population. And now that, again, that people are planting milkweed and other kinds of pollinator gardens, uh, that the monarch population is increasing again. And, and so are the... Um, populations of many insects. Some of you may be practicing no mow May, where we wait to mow our lawns until the end of May. And that gives a chance for many insects to emerge from the ground and the other places that they overwinter and uh, to reproduce and be part of our natural landscape. And there are of course some insects that we prefer very much not to have around. Um, mosquitoes are pretty pesky. But we also want to remember that 95% of insects are uh, beneficial insects and they help our garden, they help our food production. So we need to have those pollinators around to carry the pollen from apple tree to apple tree or from uh, tomato plant to tomato plant so that we get the foods that, um, that we like to eat. Also, we can think about um, you know, when we garden, one of the things that we definitely want to do is obtain a yield. So um, these are those are just a few examples of how we weave this uh, permaculture practice or um, sustainable uh, gardening into what we're doing as we're trying to grow our food at home. I'm going to switch gears a little bit now that we have the vocabulary lesson out of the way and, and we'll talk about specifically some of the hows, how to grow food. So, and when I'm saying how to grow food, how are we going to grow food using less space, less water and doing less weeding? So one way that we can think about um, gardening and, and kind of expanding our definition of what kind of space we have to garden is we can think about turning our landscaping into our garden. So rather than planting some of the familiar landscaping plants like yew shrubs and, um, and boxwoods and things like that, we can plant shrubs that are edible uh, right in our usual landscaping places. So this is the front of my house uh, where I have um, hops climbing up the porch along the side of my front door. And uh, I have some, um, I have a few uh, boxes along the front of the house. Uh, that's one of the shadiest spaces in my yard. And I grow things like lettuce in there and, and onions and a few other things. And then I have out um, along the road in what might be a traditional landscaping, you know, row of uh, some sort of evergreen tree or something. I have this really um, diverse uh, strip that has Rose of Sharon, it has gooseberries in there, um, elderberries, um, 
New Jersey tea, there's blackberries in there, pawpaws, uh, and then also some flowers like nasturtium, comfrey, um, St. John's wort, a lot of different things. Um, and I'm also working on uh, turning this into a little bit of an art project that I call uh, women's work, where I've got the, um, the uh, laundry basket and the laundry sink out there. And the next thing to add is, uh, is the ironing board, just for a little bit of whimsy and fun. Um, so if we rethink how we're using our land space, uh, our yard, and um, we can turn it, we can turn the whole thing into garden really. Uh, the concept of having a lawn came about in the late 1800s when people were starting to have enough, some people were starting to have an aff enough affluence and money that they started putting in ornamental plants or just leaving it as grass um, to show that they were so wealthy that they didn't have to use all of the land that they owned to grow food. So, so having just this lawn, a grassy lawn is kind of only about, oh, what's that uh, now about 150 year old um, uh, practice uh, that was, and I think sometimes still as a status symbol. We can, we can turn that lawn into our garden in both the traditional ways of you know, uh, setting up a little square and lots of rows or doing edible landscaping. And as we're gardening, another way where we can grow more food in less space is to think like a forest. Now I'm going to show you some pictures of my food forest garden where I have, an, I have a space that has all these different layers like a forest does. Um, so if you're out in the forest, you'll, uh, you might notice the canopy layer, the tall tree layer, the maples and oaks, and then the low tree layer, there might be some cherry trees underneath that, a shrub layer um, in, a, in a healthy forest that might be something like um, gooseberries out in the wild. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of times it's uh, right now is um, the Japanese honeysuckle, which is invasive, but but forests have a shrub layer. Um, some places where you look, it'll be things like rhododendrons if you're traveling a little bit south of here. Uh, then we get down to the herbaceous layer. That's the layer that, that um, dies back to the ground every year. Um, that can be any of your annual vegetables, um, also herbs. And then the rhizosphere, that's the, uh, the roots underground. And so we have root vegetables that we can eat, right? Carrots are a root vegetable, or we have something like horseradish. Um, we have marshmallow root that we can dig up and use. Uh, we might grow uh, potatoes or sweet potatoes. Another layer uh, in a forest is the surface of the, of the soil. So along there, you might have a ground cover like strawberry plants are a really great example and pretty tasty to eat. Um, and then we also have the vertical layer, which is the vines that grow up the trees. Um, and one layer that's not in this um, picture uh, that I'm going to redo someday, this is a drawing from uh, Robert Hart, but there's also this eighth layer of the fungal layer. Those are the, the mushrooms that you'll see growing up from the ground or out of trees. Um, and most of the, the mushrooms exist underneath the forest floor, um, kind of like a, a network, almost like a little internet or a big internet underneath the soil where the mycorrhizal fungi connect with each other, uh, with plant roots with tree roots and they weave together all the plants in a forest to help exchange nutrients, water and nutrients below the soil. Um, so we have these eight layers of where um, that could exist in a forest. And even if you're planting uh, an annual vegetable garden, um, you can use this idea of planting like a forest where you might have, say, your taller tomatoes and underneath them, you use a little bit of that shade for, um, for lettuce uh, or for spinach, things don't, that don't really want to be out in the hot sun. Um, you might also plant um, a nice little ground cover under there, like some oregano uh, that will spread out and, um, and 
reduce your weeding because the, those ground covers are really one key way to reduce the weeding that you need to do in a garden. So whether you're planting a, a, a food forest that's a small orchard, apple trees, or if you were just, uh, if you're planting um, your lettuce and tomato and, and pepper kind of garden, you can use this image of a forest and plant using those various layers. And then you can fit more food into a smaller space using that uh, design pattern. Um, this is a picture of um, my place. I have just a little bit under an acre here. Uh, you know, <laughs> that includes the creek too. So um, when I uh, first moved here um, in, 2011, uh, my, my garden looked like this lawn, like a usual lawn. Um, and uh, over time, I have developed uh, in one area um, of, the, uh, of the lawn space, I've converted, converted it to a food forest garden. Before I go to the other pictures, um, I'll just show you that in the center of the garden, if you look at the picture on the left, and you see the center of the garden, I use that space as an annual veggie space. So that's the place where, um, where I put my tomatoes and peppers and things like that. And I planted um, dozens of trees and shrubs and uh, I used, I actually have something from each of those layers that we were talking about with the forest. Um, and after two and a half years, it looked like that. And it just keeps growing and changing over time. And you can see how the layers emerge over time as my fruit and nut trees grow taller, it becomes more obvious that there's a, I'm using this forest pattern here and you can see some of the herbaceous layer plants. We've got um, some daylilies in there. If you look at the picture on the left. Um, so lots of different plants stacked into this space. Again, you can do that even with your annual veggies. Um, and I do actually have over a hundred species uh, in this. Um, it's a 0.15 acre garden. And uh, this was a picture from last summer. Another way that you can get a lot more food out of um, less space is to plant things that have a really high yield. Uh, so a lot of fruiting shrubs put out a lot of fruit for the amount of space that they take up. I have, um, I have to think for a second, I think I have five uh, current um, bushes and um, these two baskets in the picture on the left-hand side, those were just the white currants from uh, my two white current shrubs. And so then I had, uh, you know, at least uh, twice uh, more than that, probably three times more than that, because this uh, the red current then you can see in my hand on the right hand side, uh, that shrub really, really produces a lot of fruit. So planting some sort of high yielding fruiting shrub that's edible for you or for the birds if you don't wanna eat the food that's growing in your garden. This is a great way to grow a lot of food in less space. Um, aronia is another shrub that's really fabulous. Um, I once saw a video of a man who uh, just loved aronia and he picked 40 quarts of aronia berries off of his, off of one shrub, which was pretty amazing. Um, so aronia are also known as chokeberries. Um, they are a very nutritious, uh, fruit, they actually have more phytonutrients than elderberries do. Um, and we all know, I think, how healthy elderberries are. So you can think about um, planting some fruit shrubs as a way to get more food in less space. Also, you can think about um, how to, basically by changing the pattern of how you're planting in the ground, you can have more food and less space and less watering just simply by changing um, the pattern of planting. And so, um, you know, up here we have this like example of your typical row garden. Um, this was the kind of garden that I grew up where, you know, the rows were straight and, um, 
you know, wide enough for the rototiller to get down through. Uh, and that's how we grow our food. And that's a fine way to do it. But if we're trying to um, grow more food with less space and do less watering, we can think about this hexagonal pattern um, where we're basically doing double staggered rows or offset rows. Um, and when you use this planting pattern, you can get 16% more food in the same amount of space. So basically um, what this is, is you'll plant one row and then on the next row, you just move everything over by half. And so if things are spaced six inches apart, um, then you would just uh, on the second row, slide everything over. They're still six inches apart, but there are, it's three inches. Um, between each row and you end up with this hexagonal pattern uh, that's very effective in terms of space use. Um, uh, it, the reason that it, there's less water and less weeding is, is because as the plants um, grow in this pattern, they actually fill in more of the space. So they're covering the soil, which means that they're helping to keep the water in the soil, keep it from evaporating. And also because they're creating more of a canopy, there's not as much light to get down to the soil to stimulate the weed growth. So you can use this hexagonal pattern uh, to get more food in less space and um, have fewer weeds and less watering. Another tip. Another uh, way to fill in these spaces are to plant things that you like that are weedy um, with purpose. So if you've ever planted anise hyssop, you know that you end up with not just one anise hyssop, but lots of anise, hip, anise hyssops. Pretty much anything in the mint family fills in a lot of space. Now you might not want to use mint or you might not want to use the um, sunchokes that are in the picture on the right-hand side. But if we're trying to uh, get more food in less space, if we plant plants that expand naturally, they'll um, help us fill in the spaces and again, uh, cover the soil so that you're not having as, as um, many weeds. Uh, you won't need to water as much because it will help cover the soil and keep the water in the soil. So that's another way. Another uh, option is to also eat some of your weeds. Many of us have a lot of edible weeds that show up right in our lawn spaces that we don't even have to plant because they're, um, they're already there or the, you know, the animals bring them into us. Um, things like dandelion and purslain and wood sorrel and violets and plantain. These are all things that in just about any yard, as long as, as, long as somebody isn't using um, weed killer, uh, there's a really, really good chance that you have some of these edible um, plants in your lawn. And so the cool thing about that is you don't even have to grow them because they're already there and you can just forage them. So um, that's another way to uh, get some food, you know, out of your space, even if you are going to have um, all or part of your lawn as lawn, uh, if you kind of let it grow naturally, uh, especially if you do no mow may, that kind of allow some of the wildflowers and some of the uh, weeds <laughs> uh, uh, to grow. And I just think of a weed as a plant that is where someone doesn't want it to be uh, because just about every plant has a purpose, even poison ivy. Poison ivy helps to protect soils that are degraded and keep humans out of there. <laughs> so um, while nature works to restore it. So, um, you know, so if we think about, we think, uh, Rethink our thoughts on weeds um, and see which of those we can eat. That's another great way to get some more food. Um, compost, maybe many of you know about composting. So we'll talk a little bit about how, and we can talk a little bit about uh, why. So when we're planting, like in that hexagonal pattern, for example, uh, we do have more plants in that air in that same amount of area. And you might have been asking yourself, well, won't they need more water because there's more plants there? So one thing is they will need more fertility in the soil. And compost is a way of adding for, uh, fertility to the soil. Also, when we add compost, 
to our soil, we're adding organic matter and that makes more surface area in the soil and that allows the soil to hold and absorb more water and to retain more water. Um, so using compost can be, and, and adding it to your, um, to the places that you're gardening is a really important way, not only to increase the uh, fertility of your soil and therefore the health of your plants, but also to help support that idea of growing more food and less space and where you're doing less watering. Compost will also, generally speaking, <laughs> unless you're bringing in weeds uh, with a compost, uh, compost generally tends to help a, a space be less weedy over time because you are building the soil fertility and a lot of the plants that we think of as weeds are really there um, to rescue the soil and to protect it uh, because the soil has been disturbed um, or degraded in some way. Um, so when we're composting, we can do compost we can have a really long conversation about compost, but I'll just talk about it in, in a couple of quick ways. Um, and uh, compost is basically putting green stuff and brown stuff together, uh, wet stuff and dry stuff together, um, nitrogen and carbon together. Um, each of those uh, formulas are, are compost. So green plus brown, nitrogen plus carbon, uh, and wet plus dry. Those are all, um, that's really all it takes for compost. You can have a hot compost um, out in the sun where your, uh, your compost pile will heat up enough that you can actually burn your hand if you put it in there um, and get that thermophilic reaction, which is um, what it's called when you get, um, get the temperature up in the compost high enough for the weed seeds to, uh, and many other things to, um, to be killed off actually. Uh, and you can also do um, cold compost uh, um, where if the only place you have to do compost is under your kitchen sink in a milk carton or you know, out in a shady uh, spot, um, you know, that works too. It just works a little bit slower and, uh, um, and it doesn't, you don't get the effect of killing off weed seeds and other things. Um, you can actually make compost just from grass. So say you um, do mow your grass, you can let the, the clippings dry and that would be your brown or your carbon. And then when you cut the grass again and you use the, the fresh clippings, um, then that would be your nitrogen source. And so you could in, in a bin or a piece of wiring or um, just in a pile in your yard, you could stack the dry grass with wet grass and then dry grass and wet grass. So you can just make compost just um, with that. My compost pile tends to have a lot of things in it. Um, a lot of kitchen scraps, um, which are a source of nitrogen, they're the green stuff. A lot of um, things that I'm clearing out from my garden, trimming from my garden, um, that goes in there. Uh, also shredded paper. Uh, I try to shred pretty much everything um, that, uh, that I can instead of putting in the recycling bin and that becomes my carbon source. So that's free um, free and available carbon source right there um, just to use my, um, my office uh, paper. Um, and of course you can also use um, weeds uh, um, that you're pulling out of your garden and then leaves that you're raking up off of your lawn. I do wanna say I'm a huge advocate though of leaving your lawn clippings on, your, on the ground along with your leaves because they do help rebuild the soil. But so compost, compost can be a really great way to um, not only build the fertility of your soil, but also uh, make it so that your plants require less water because they're, the soil will hold more water and it can help you grow more plants in less space and also do less weeding. There we go. Um, another way to essentially do compost is to do what's called sheet mulching. 
And sheet mulching is effectively composting right where you're going to have um, a garden bed. And you'll see some um, more pictures. Uh, this is how I establish my garden. You can use this method of sheet mulching in a raised bed. You can use it in an existing garden. You can use it in a lawn that you're converting to garden. Um, and it's a great way to create no-till garden beds. And this is um, something that I think is, um, is really important. The less we disturb the soil that we're working with, the fewer weeds we're going to have. Because there are some weeds that are, their seeds lie, can lie dormant in the soil for years, decades, um, and certainly a decade. Uh, and then when the soil gets disturbed, that will prompt the weeds to grow. Um, I experienced that here and I was delighted actually. I had, um, I had a spot in the garden that um, the, in the center, it used to just be mulched. And if I were teaching a class, we would just sit there. Well, then I decided to use it as an annual garden bed because it really gets the most sun in my garden. So I took the wood chips out from there and um, began to plant directly into the soil. Well, even though it had been covered uh, for probably four or five years at that point, when I started disturbing the soil, planting some tomatoes in there and some garlic and some other things like that, uh, I had an amazing crop of lamb's quarters, which is one of my favorite weeds to eat. Um, and that only happened um, for the first year because I was just suddenly disturbing the soil. So that's why uh, the less tilling we do for our garden soil, the fewer weeds we will have. Um, so this method of sheet mulching, again, is just putting together nitrogen and carbon, really. Um, if you're going over a lawn to convert it into a, a garden bed, your, the grass and whatever weeds are there can be your nitrogen layer. Um, if, uh, if you want to, if you have the resources available, you can also add some um, comfrey, which is a wonderful plant that's like growing your own fertilizer. Um, you can also put manure uh, on that layer. And then you're gonna cover that up um, with cardboard, corrugated cardboard. Um, that's the cardboard that has the, um, the air spaces in it, not the box board, which is your cereal um, box or you know cracker box or things like that, but use corrugated cardboard and cover up um, either right over the soil or if you've put some manure down, um, make sure that you overlap the cardboard um, pieces by about an inch and a half so you don't get the crabgrass rhizomes um, peeking through. And then over the top of that, you can put a mulch layer to help hold down the cardboard. The cardboard acts as a weed uh, suppressant that will help um, to kill off um, whatever is growing underneath it. Um, and then the mulch layer will help hold the cardboard down. Also, that will begin to decompose too. So you can use straw, you can use wood chips, you can use leaves. I prefer to use leaves or straw in any places where I'm growing annual veggies or um, flowers. And then I tend to use wood chips where I have my perennial garden. Uh, if you're trying to fill a raised bed with soil without buying soil, you can do layers of the sheet mulching. So, you know, your grass, some cardboard, uh, some leaves, you can put in kitchen scraps um, or manure, another layer of cardboard, some more uh, leaves, um, and build up those layers. That's called lasagna gardening. And if you did that in the fall, by the next spring, you'd have some pretty decent soil to start um, growing in that raised bed. So taking composting out of the compost bin and doing this method instead um, is a way that will increase your soil fertility so you can grow more food in less space. This will um, turn a space into a garden bed without tilling, so you'll have fewer weeds. And because you're adding a lot of organic matter to the soil, you'll also need to water it less frequently. 
and uh, this is a picture um, of when I, uh, the first fall that I was working here uh, where I live to convert um, some of the lawn into this uh, food forest garden space. And you can see, I did this sheet mulching right over the lawn. And by the next spring, um, I did this in the fall. And then by the next spring, the cardboard had um, mostly disintegrated and the soil was really fabulous. Um, and I was able to just plant right into those beds. You can also, um, you can grow your own fertilizer if you keep chickens. Um, hopefully you live in a, in a town that uh, allows you to keep chickens. Um, and if you don't, please uh, work with your town to, um, to make that possible. Um, so if you have chickens, they're really fabulous. They can help you uh, dig up a garden bed. If you keep them in an area, they'll um, till the soil for you and uh, eat a lot of the bugs. Um, they produce fertilizer that's really fabulous to put in your compost pile or to put in your beds in the fall and let it sit for over winter. And if you uh, raise laying chickens then you also have the benefit of eggs. Another way to have less weeding and watering is to plant perennials instead of annuals. Um, even if you're grow growing flowers, instead of some of the annual flowers, uh, start cultivating a lot more perennials. When you, uh, when you plant perennials, not only do you save money over time because you don't have to buy seeds or plants every year, um, you also are, because you're not replanting that bed every year, you're doing less soil disturbance, so you won't be triggering those weed seeds. Uh, the perennials will spread out over time. We say the first year they sleep, the second year they creep, and the third year they leap. So it takes a little bit of time for the perennials to spread and establish, but that will help um, you know, cover that soil so you don't have to water as much. You'll have fewer weeds. And many, many uh, flowers even uh, are edible. So for example, bee balm. Uh, bee balm is in the mint family. The leaves and the petals are fabulous in salads and um, you can decorate your butter with the, with the flower petals. Uh, so, uh, and also I get hummingbirds that come to visit my bee balm every year. So that's a, a fabulous bonus. So whether it's perennial flowers or perennial vegetables, um, or you know, fruit trees and shrubs, we can have less weeding and less watering um, when we use perennials because the, the roots get really established. They go deeper in the soil, um, so you don't have to water as often. And so I also grow some perennial vegetables. Um, the picture in the bottom left is a perennial sea kale. Right now, I'm picking off these really tender, sweet um, broccoli florets, basically, off of them. Some people blanch the leaves and eat the leaves. Um, and then in the other picture, you can see, uh, oops, in the other picture, you can see um, in the front, there's uh, what are called Egyptian walking onions. They're a perennial onion. Uh, in the picture here, you can see that they're starting to go to seed at top. They'll make like a little cluster of teeny tiny onions about as big as my thumbnail. Um, and then they'll send up another uh, sprout and that will flower and make another cluster of onions. And then it gets heavy. So they tip over and plant themselves in the soil next to the original plant, which is why they're called um, Egyptian walking onion onions. And behind those, uh, the yellow flowers are from a plant called Turkish rocket, which is actually native to our area. Um, it is in the broccoli family. And so like all broccoli um, family plants, you can eat the leaves, you can eat the flowers, you can eat the seeds. So um, with Turkish rocket, they're a bitter uh, spring green leaf. Um, the florets before they go to flower again are like broccoli and you can uh, then eat the flowers and the pollinators really love them. So these are some perennial vegetables that you can think about growing and again less soil disturbance, less watering, less weeding. 
and you can grow perennials without giving up annuals. So if you really love tomatoes and lettuce and some other things that are annuals, you can mix them in with the perennials. Um, companion planting is a really great way, again, to use that um, forest gardening concept and uh, grow things next to each other. I've been having a lot of fun with one of my garden beds that has asparagus in it and gooseberries and um, I have some strawberries in there. And then I typically will also put some tomatoes and some calendula in there. And those are all supposed to be really great uh, companion plants. Um, and it makes it kind of fun too. Even if you have shade, uh, which especially if you live in an urban um, space, a lot of um, folks are lucky. Night with shade is a great thing to have when it's really hot out, right? Um, but it can be kind of pesky when you're trying to grow food. There are a number of plants that will thrive in shade. Um, you can even grow, for example, garden peas. They actually prefer to be in, in part shade, um, to be shielded from the hot afternoon sun. But other things like um, red currants, good, good King Henry, which is a perennial spinach, the perennial sea kale that I talked about, chives, all different kinds of strawberries, especially the woodland strawberries, they thrive in shade. And then um, even these mushrooms that are called wine caps, they're very easy to learn to identify them um, and pretty tasty. Uh, these will all grow in the shade. So even if that's, even if you have a yard with a lot of trees, there are lots and lots of plants that will produce food um, in the shade. And this is just a small sample of the plants that will uh, produce food in the shade. And also sometimes we have walnuts. There's three walnuts in the corner of my yard. Uh, and one, actually only one is on my property line. There again are a number, um, so walnuts produce a hormone called juglone that helps them outcompete other plants, other trees in the forest. So not everything will grow under walnuts. Tomatoes do not grow under walnuts very well anyway. Um, but there are, um, there are many, many plants that will grow under walnuts. Uh, Dave, Jackie, and Eric Tonesmeyer's book, Edible Forest Gardens, um, has actually a list of 56 plants, food producing plants that um, will grow under walnuts. I have things like violets, stone crop, um, Rose of Sharon, mulberry, pawpaws, daylilies. Um, that I have growing underneath my walnuts. Um, and probably the slide was supposed to be back a couple. <laughs> so uh, just as we're thinking about perennial vegetables, um, we're, besides not disturbing the soil and, and needing less water and having fewer weeds, we're also keeping the carbon in the soil, which helps us um, with mitigating um, climate change to some extent because uh, we're keeping the carbon in the soil uh, where it belongs because we're not disturbing the soil as much. Uh, another way to grow food even in your home um, is container gardening. So if you have a bright sunny window or a window where you get a little sun, um, you can have a, a planter and have um, like a salad bowl of lettuce that you grow uh, in any kind of container. I've seen people use shoes and work boots and pants and um, bricks. Uh, there's just all kinds of, pretty much any container uh, can be reimagined as a garden, it's just a matter of what you put in there and if you need to put some drainage in. Um, but so if you wanna grow food in your home, a couple of good candidates are things like this, um, the lettuce bowl in the top. You can also grow microgreens, which is where you densely plant things like either kale or radishes or sunflower seeds. And then you just eat the greens when they're you know, an inch to three inches tall. And that's a fabulous way to get some good healthy food into your body in the middle of winter. Um, also, I know some people grow mushrooms inside of their homes. Um, many mushrooms will prefer to be outdoors, but you can uh, grow mushrooms in your home, either in um, bags uh, or um, 
in your basement in logs. I highly recommend um, Smug Town Mushrooms. We're really lucky to have Olga uh, here. She has all the tools and all the know-how. Uh, if you want to grow mushrooms inside or outside, um, do check out the resources from Smug Town Mushrooms and you can get your supplies there. Another way to grow more healthy food in, uh, in less space um, is to use some unexpected places to grow food. So for example, um, this uh, garden, this picture on the left used to be over um, in the Highland Park neighborhood. Um, I think the people sold it and moved because uh, they took their house out or the garden out of the yard and, and then there was a for sale sign. Um, but there was a pizza garden in between the sidewalk and the road. So tomatoes, and basil and parsley and onions, all kinds of things in this space, the strip that's sometimes called the parkway. It's that, that real estate in between the sidewalk and the road. Um, so you can put food out there. And uh, that is going to be a, typically a very hot environment unless you happen to have a lot of trees because you've got the, the pavement of the road, which is dark and the, the paved sidewalk and you get this really, um, this heat sink in between uh, because of the, those materials will get heated up by the sun. So out in a space like that, I recommend that you put things that really like the heat. Um, those nightshades, so things like tomatoes and peppers, they really like those hot spaces. So they're a really good candidate for that area. You can also think about um, growing, uh, again, using that vertical space. And um, the picture on the right are some scarlet runner beans that um, grow up one of the stumps in my garden. I took um, a couple of trees down in there when I was getting it established and kept the stumps in there to, um, to use for various purposes, in, including uh, being a pole for my beans to grow up. Um, and then, you know, the stump becomes not only a place for woodpeckers and, and other critters to use, but also a food production space. And it makes it really pretty. Uh, scarlet runner beans are beautiful and you can eat the flowers, you can eat the beans when they're green, you can eat them, uh, let them get really big and then eat the dry seeds later on in the winter time. Um, so we can get more food out of a smaller space when we're really creative about where we grow things. And remembering that our our edible landscaping can really be anywhere. There's some plants that are just so beautiful, like the asparagus fern on the left, um, that just after uh, we stop harvesting the asparagus, the ferns just get really tall and, and gorgeous and stay that way well into the fall. Um, they can be a, a great privacy screen. So you're getting some food and and this beautiful fern. And then in the, on the right hand side, you can see the red leaves of the um, blueberry plant. And I know some people are big fans of the, uh, oh gosh, I'm trying to think of what that bush is. Uh, it's a flaming bush. Um, anyway, it's an invasive shrub that turns this beautiful, beautiful red every fall. Guess what? Blueberries do the very same thing and they make really awesome fruit. Um, and if you don't want to eat it, uh, the birds and the squirrels will be really glad uh, to eat the blueberries for you. As a matter of fact, during blueberry season in my garden, um, I need to get up every morning and get right out in the garden and get whatever blueberries are ripe um, before the birds start picking them off. So um, that's another way to, to kind of reimagine your space to fit more food into whatever space you do have is to keep in mind this idea of edible landscaping using these layers that we've talked about. And to just try to have a beginner's mind about our space and how we use it and, and what we do with it. Um, at my place, I would have this front lawn that's in between the, the strip of edible landscaping in my house. Unfortunately for me, that's where my septic system is. So I haven't, um, turned that into a garden yet, but that is, um, that's why I happen to have grass there. Um, and again, that could be another, another topic entirely, but just really 
you know, take a fresh look. And if, um, if, if you are so used to seeing your yard the way it is, you could ask a neighbor or a friend, hey, I want to grow some food in my yard, but I'm really stuck in how, you know, I think about how I use my space. Um, would you come over and give me some ideas? Um, which reminds me, another way to grow more food in less space, and I have a friend who does this, is if you have neighbors who have bright sunshine and you don't, or have shade and you don't, or have space that they're not really using, you can ask about uh, planting in their yard as well. I have a neighbor who um, they've taken the fence down. Uh, I'm sorry, I have a friend who with their neighbor, they've taken down the fence in between their yards and planted really nice food producing plants in there that are beautiful and they share the food. And then uh, I know that this friend also gardens in at least one other neighbor's yard where there's a lot of sunshine. So you just work out some sort of arrangement about that. You know, if you can use some of their space, you can share some of the food with them. Um, and you might find that that works out really well um, as a way to uh, not only um, grow more food, uh, but also to build some connections with your neighbors. And, um, and you never know how that will turn out, hopefully in a good way for you. So remember when you're thinking about your garden, and especially if you're working with perennials, that abundance changes from year to year. So for example, last year uh, was a mass year for some of the nut trees in our area, and that happens like every four years. Um, so there might be years where you get a lot of food from one of the things you plant, and then the next year, not so much. So that's why it's good to have a lot of different kinds of food growing around you and to not be reliant on any one particular crop because, um, because the circumstances will change. And when we do these things, when we plant our gardens, when we organize our yard space, whatever spaces we're lucky enough to steward, um, and we do it with some intention and some of these practices that reduce weeding and watering, um, we get the thing that we probably want um, the most of, which is some time to relax, some time to have fun, um, be with people we care about. So that can be the greatest reward of all. Um, if you are interested in learning more about uh, things that I do, you can join my meetup group. And uh, we have activities occasionally there. It's been a little less regular during the pandemic, but um, we have activities there. There are lots of people that you can connect with. And that's the way to find out um, about many of the events that I'm organizing. And then also there is a regional organization called the Permaculture Association of the Northeast. That's a great way to connect with other people who are interested in growing food and lots of other you know, uh, interests, envir uh, environmental um, care and things like that. Um, and uh, full disclosure, I'm a former board member and uh, a member of that organization. It's a great way to, to learn more. So um, this uh, is being recorded, all of the great things that I've said and all of the stumbles um, that you'll have access to the recording for a period of time. And also I'm going to um, turn this presentation into a PDF uh, and send that to Amy and then Amy will um, send it to all of the folks who have registered for, uh, for this presentation. And if you want to reach me, here's my contact information that gives you lots and lots of ways um, to reach me if you have more questions. So what I'm going to do now is take a look at the chat window and we can um, see what's in there, and I will see what I know about what's in there. <laughs> see if I can do that without messing up the slideshow. Uh, all right, let's see. 
Patty, I can also read the questions to you if you'd like. Oh, super. Yeah, thank you. That works great for me. Sure. Um, Lisa asked, is ink on the shredded paper or cardboard harmful or okay to use? Yeah, um, so that's a great question. Uh, you know, nothing's perfect, even the rain isn't organic. So fortunately, uh, many of the inks these days are like a soy based or vegetable based ink. So um, they tend to be much safer than they used to be. Um, uh, Sometimes cardboard boxes are fumigated, so you know you can think about that and and try to know if the if the cardboard is only you know stayed in the United States or if it's come from other places around the world where they um, fumigate it. Um, but the the inks generally are not a problem these days. I do tend to stay away from glossy cardboard boxes. So if there's something like with a big bright picture on it, I typically will pass that by for just something that's a, a lot more like just plain brown cardboard. Um, and if it just has some, you know, some ink, some printing on it, I, I tend not to worry about that very much. Sounds good, thank you. And uh, another question from Lisa, um, does good compost require animal poop, i.e. manure? Uh, no, um, I don't think so. So good compost is uh, really about having a good balance of nitrogen and carbon. Um, if your compost pile is smelly, it needs more carbon. Um, because if, if, it's, uh, if it smells bad, that means that the anaerobic um, bacterial action has started to happen. And that's okay because that is a way that, um, you know, that, that um, food and things get broken down with this anaerobic. Um, there's anaerobic, anaerobic. Anaerobic is without oxygen, anaerobic is with oxygen. Um, the anaerobic bacterial process is a lot smellier. Um, so if your compost is um, smelly, it's because it needs more carbon. And so you can add more paper, add more leaves, add more. Um, uh, you know, whatever you have that's kind of the brown stuff. Um, there is some correlation between what you put in your uh, compost and the quality of, you know, the nutrients that you're getting out of it. If, you know, if you're putting in uh, office paper as opposed to leaves, um, the leaves are going to have a lot of minerals and things in them that the office paper will not have. Um, but manure is not essential. Um, another nitrogen source that you can use, and yes, I'm going to say this on a recorded, <laughs> recorded webinar, is you can use your own urine on your own garden um, if you like. Uh, that is a fabulous nitrogen source. So um, put it in your compost as a nitrogen source, and that's a great way, again, to add uh, add more fertility uh, to, to what you're producing with the compost. So manure is not essential. It is absolutely fabulous though, because it does have so much nutrition in it. So um, I do recommend manure if you have access to it. All right, thank you. Um, a question from Lori, she said, when adding compost to soil, do I mix it in or just layer on top? I tend to um, layer on top um, because then I'm not disturbing the soil. Um, and as the rain happens and as the sun is on the compost, it will break it down and make the, the good things that are in the compost, um, you know, help them uh, reach the roots of your plants. And over time, just the process of gardening and, and what plants do and what humans do in the garden, the compost will uh, over time get mixed in um, with the soil. Um, so you can use that either as a top dressing where you spread it over the top or a side dressing in the summertime. You can go along existing plants and just put some compost over the roots where your plants are already growing. And if you, um, another way to use compost, I'm just gonna riff off the question a little bit, is to make an activated compost tea. And this is great if you don't have a lot of compost. Um, or if you don't have a lot of quality compost, you can take some compost, like a couple of handfuls or a couple of cups and put it in a five gallon bucket with water, with something like molasses 
you can also use some um, humic acid if you have it. I mean, there are any number of additional things that you can put in there, but essentially a little bit of compost, um, some water, and then uh, molasses. Um, and then if you have a submersible, make sure it's a safely submersible pump to put in that bucket and let it cycle that um, compost through the water uh, and, and mix in with the molasses for 24 hours, you can take that little bit of compost and now it's a compost tea that you can then spread um, in your garden. You can use it as a foliar feeder on, on your shrubs, your trees and shrubs, or you can just use it to go along and water your garden. Um, and that's a way to increase the fertility of some compost that you have because that um, molasses um, starts to get some uh, really great critters growing in there that um, it's called activated compost tea. I think hey, I answered your thank question. You. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, Desiree asked fish emulsion versus cow manure, which is better? Um, I don't know that one is better than the other. Um, I think the best fertilizers to use are from nature for sure. Some form of manure or fish emulsion. Um, and then the, the second um, criteria is what you have. So if you have access to cow manure, you, you know, you're not gonna put it straight on your garden um, in the spring, you could put it on in the, in the fall um, or put it through your compost uh, pile and then into the garden because it's gonna be too hot. It'll be very high in nitrogen and it will um, possibly burn your plants. Um, but I don't know that uh, that either cow manure or fish emulsion is better. They're just different. And whatever you have is the best one to use. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, Yvonne asked, in an urban environment, rats can be a problem for a compost pile. Any idea for avoiding that problem? Yeah, there are a couple of um, things you can do. There are a lot of compost containers that you can use. And especially if you have like a tumbler that's kind of like a barrel turned on its side and it's up off the ground, um, that's one way to <clears throat> avoid having um, a problem with rats is to have some sort of container and, and a container that they can't uh, get into. I have seen people also make a tumbler by getting a, a metal barrel uh, and, um, and then putting it up on a rack and making a door and, and then turning it. If it's a metal barrel, you can also just um, cut a door in it and put a latch on it. Uh, and you can put your compost materials in there and then just roll it around on the ground. And that should be uh, fairly critter proof. Another way um, to make a compost pile that's fairly critter proof um, somehow um, sometimes they'll still find a little crack, but if you build a compost bin, um, kind of like the one that I have, and then if you line it with hardware cloth, hardware cloth is basically um, fencing that has a quarter inch grid. Um, it is kind of pricey and sometimes your neighbor will put some out and you can pick it up along the road. Um, I was really lucky like that. <clears throat> Excuse me, so if you line the inside of your compost bin with hardware cloth, top, bottom, sides, um, that will uh, keep the critters out of your compost bin as long as you don't have any gaps. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, those are all the questions that have been submitted so far in the chat. If anyone would like to ask any more questions, please feel free to type them in now. Oh, um, Lori asked, how do you feed your plants? Um, I feed my plants um, with compost occasionally. Um, I actually have comfrey spread out, uh, spread throughout my garden. And um, I use that as a chop and drop. So comfrey is a plant that has a very deep taproot. Uh, so it's called a dynamic accumulator or a nutrient accumulator. If you've ever dug a, a dandelion out of your yard, you know they have a very deep taproot too. So comfrey has this deep taproot and the taproot goes down into the deeper uh, layers of the soil 
and pulls up some of the minerals that are being released into the soil from the rock layer. And as it's pulling those minerals up, it's pulling it up into its leaves. Um, so what I do is I grow comfrey in different spaces around my garden, and then I will chop it off a couple of inches above the ground, take those leaves and spread them around the fruit trees and other things in my garden. Um, and basically I'm, you know, fertilizing in a slow and small kind of way. Uh, and then probably about three weeks later, kind of depending on the weather, I can do chop and drop again and I'll put those leaves some other place. Um, usually somewhere between three and five chop and drop sessions in the, um, in the growing season. Uh, I also do compost and compost tea. And I also will, um, I do uh, what's called pea cycling where I will take um, urine, I dilute it um, usually about uh, 10 to one. Um, and then I will put that on my garden, especially over the winter time um, to get more nitrogen into the soil. Um, those are the ways that I feed my plants. Excellent, thank you. Um, Lisa asked, any ideas on amending clay soil? Would the sheet mulching method work over time? Yes, I think that it will. Um, clay can be really tricky and I, I have pretty much a lot of different kinds of soil here. Um, my space is on the edge of, you know, the, the creek bed. Um, and at one point the creek um, was actually much higher. So I have these sandy spaces and I have places where I have a lot of clay. With clay, the uh, one of the ways to, um, to break that up a little bit um, is to add more organic matter to it uh, because the organic matter will help separate some of the particles over time. It helps um, you know, add more air spaces into the soil. So the sheet mulching is a really great way to add that organic matter to the clay soils um, and, uh, and help to um, lighten it uh, a little bit over time. Adding as much organic matter as you can uh, is a really key way for working with clay. Excellent, thank you. Well, we've reached the end of the current, uh, current questions in the chat box again. Is there any other questions? Are there any other questions anyone would like to ask? Oh, okay. Um, Lisa said um, a follow up to the clay soil. Are there any good plants that will grow in clay soil, please? Mm. So um, I'd have to know a lot more in terms of recommending um, particular plants uh, because um, it depends on how much sun there is, it depends on how wet the soil is. Uh, but basically um, with clay soil, you need to be planting plants that have some pretty tough roots um, and, and strong roots. So like carrots are not going to grow well in, in clay soil. Um, I grew up actually, my family's garden was, uh, had a lot of clay in it. Um, so we would just grow the short carrots instead. Um, so I think that some of the keys with clay are to make sure that it's not too wet when you're doing any working of the soil because it compacts so easily. And in terms of plants to use um, in that soil, it's really gonna depend on a lot of other factors. Um, you know, and definitely, um, you know, whatever tree or shrub um, plants would be appropriate given the sunlight and the and the um, moisture in the soil. Those are especially uh, easy to grow in clay because you're not you know constantly in there working like you would be if you were planting lettuce or something like that. I hope that's helpful, Lisa. Great, thank you. Let's see here, if there's any more questions. Um, Lori said one of your photos looks like you had a rain barrel. Do you have one and do you use it to water your garden? Yes, I do have a rain barrel and um, I have that. Uh, I'll see if I can, I won't um, make you go through um, all of the slides with me, but let me just get back to, uh, to that slide and I'll put it back up. Um, so, 
Uh, yes, I have a rain barrel. I'll show you that picture. I'll pull it up. And, oops, I need to share the screen before I do that. <laughs> We're almost there. Okay, yes, yeah, so this is my rain barrel. Um, and uh, I wanna say, I'm gonna answer your question expansively again, because we have time. Um, this rain barrel came from the H2O Hero program, which is part of Monroe County. I highly recommend their rain barrels. Um, they, it's a kit. Um, last I knew there were $55, but I don't, I'm not up to date on that. That was a few years ago. They have great instructions and the, um, the plumbing materials that are provided in the kit are very high quality. Uh, so it's really easy to put together and to set up. I have my rain barrel um, set up on top of some cement blocks for a couple of reasons. One is I actually run it, uh, I use a washing machine hose and I run it to my the sink that's here. And then I use that sink for washing hands or taking the, um, you know, the biggest layer of soil off of uh, any um, roots that I'm bringing into my house before they get into my kitchen sink. Um, and then also I can uh, run the water over to my garden. Um, because it's raised up, that gives me some water pressure uh, to uh, have it be able to go over to my garden and go through the drip irrigation hose that I use. Um, so I highly recommend rain barrels and I actually recommend several rain barrels. Uh, if you look it up, you can find the calculation for the size of your roof and find out for each inch of rain that you get, how much water um, will run off into off of your roof. Uh, and you would be amazed at how many hundreds or thousands of gallons it can be in a year, depending on your roof size. <clears throat> um, and you can find that calculation online. So I highly recommend rain barrels. Um, the rainwater is really awesome. My plants are so happy they respond to it. It has more nitrogen in it, um, the chemical composition is different than water that comes out of my hose. Uh, and another key tip with a rain barrel is to make sure that there's an overflow because as I said, it will fill up a lot faster than you can imagine. And then the water is going to go somewhere. And if it's right next to your house, it could end up you know, right um, down next to your basement wall and you could end up with water in your basement, things like that. So there have been, I happen to have drain tiles here um, at the house. So my overflow on my rain barrel goes into, uh, into that drain tile. Lori asked if you could please repeat where you purchased the rain barrel pictured. Um, the rain barrel came from h2ohero.org, h2o like water, h2ohero.org. Um, a program of Monroe County. Okay, thank you. And she said, where does the water in the outdoor sink drain? Um, into the bucket that's underneath it. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah, I don't have any, um, uh, yep, I just keep the bucket there and then I'll either take it and water some plants or put it through my compost pile, depending on how much soil is in there. I don't, I want, um, I'm, typically not only capturing the water, but I'm also capturing soil that's either coming off of my hands or my tools or my food. Um, and I wanna keep that soil too and return it to the earth somewhere. Neat, thank you very much. You're welcome. All right, anyone else like to ask Patty a question in the chat box? Um, we have another question. What flowers do you recommend as natural deterrents to aphids and other pests from Bunny? Mm, um, well, 
kind of a permaculture approach to something like aphids um, are to think about what uh, what is the predator for the bug that's a problem? So in the case of aphids, for example, um, it's really helpful to have a lot of uh, ladybugs in your garden. And ladybugs tend to like flowers that have, um, ladybugs have small mouth parts and um, they tend to like flowers that are really kind of shallow and um, uh, so not something that's really deep-throated like the bee balm flowers. Uh, they like to have things like sweet alyssum. I see a lot of ladybug larvae on my um, beach plum shrub uh, because they, um, they like that, that kind of habitat. So the more ladybugs I can have, the fewer aphids I'm going to have. Um, so I recommend, uh, you know, flowers with the small um, mouth parts, like the couple of that I mentioned. Um, and then in terms of deterring pests, uh, bunnies are really tricky. You can find lists of, of plants that bunnies don't eat, but bunnies don't read those lists. Um, and when they're hungry, they'll eat pretty much anything. Um, so, kind of the most effective deterrent for, for bunnies, uh, for rabbits, <laughs> not for bunny who's on the call, but is to, um, fencing is really a great deterrent. Another um, way to, uh, to deter some pests are to use plants that are called um, aromatic pest confusers. So what that means is they're plants that have really strong fragrances and <clears throat> That makes it harder for, um, for Mr. Woodchuck to sniff out your lettuce patch if it's surrounded by plants that are aromatic pest confusers. Now, what are some of those plants? Um, basically anything in the onion family and anything in the mint family. So mint can be wonderful and it can also be really pesky because spearmint, peppermint, all of those things really, really spread a lot if you don't want to have mint that's spreading around. I highly recommend mountain mint, which happens to make a fabulous tea. It's one of my favorite mints and it's more of a clumper. So if you use mints and then onions, so your garden chives, the Egyptian walking onions, perennial onions, um, nodding wild onions, those are a really fabulous plant and, and native by the way. Those you can use around your um, garden to help deter pests, prevent pests from finding um, your food. Um, and another plant that's often helpful um, are daffodils around the edge of your garden. Uh, again, critters don't read books, so I'm sure there are exceptions, but planting a row of daffodils around your food, even if you just have a little simple bed raised bed, um, plant some daffodils around there and presumably that helps keep out woodchucks, which you didn't ask about, um, and, uh, and voles. I'm not sure about rabbits. I don't ever notice rabbits eating my daffodils, um, but I'm not sure that they'll keep rabbits away. So that may have only been a partially helpful answer. Thank you very much. Um, Bunny also asked, could you please repeat the names of the plants that ladybugs like? Yes, they like um, plants that have small flowers on them. So for example, one of the um, specific plants is sweet alyssum. It's a really beautiful flowering plant that comes in a lot of colors and that's a really good um, habitat for ladybugs. And a perennial plant that I have that I've noticed that's really um, has a lot of ladybug larva on it every year uh, is my beach plum, which is a shrub. And you have to have two of those in order to get better pollination and more fruit. Um, and so if you look at the flowers of those plants, that will help you then find uh, flowers with similar shapes that will also likely be good um, ladybug uh, food and habitat. Another, another thing to think about 
is to try to keep your plants as healthy as possible. When plants are stressed, either because they don't have enough water or they have too much water, um, uh, for example, when they're stressed, they send out uh, chemical signals that are you know, kind of like a, a siren going off, like I'm dying, I'm dying. And that um, can be helpful to the plant because sometimes some other plants will provide it some of the things it's needing to, um, to survive, but also insects pick up on those signals. And so we tend to have things like aphids when um, the plants are distressed in some way. And a lot of times that's through a drought. So that's another way to deter aphids. Thank you. And Mary Rose uh, said she has a rain barrel but doesn't like to leave it out in the winter. What is the best thing to do with it during, during the winter, please? Yes, so what I do um, is uh, my rain barrel is set up so that I cut my downspout and the in the summer when I have the rain barrel set up, the downspout just um, has a diverter that goes over and delivers the water on top of a screen in the rain barrel and then it goes down through. And then the overflow uh, takes the too much water back down to the drain tile um, where the downspout, if it were in place, um, would take it. In the winter, I take that apart. I take uh, my rain barrel, I drain it if I need to. And then I turn it upside down right on the other side of those um, blocks. I turn it upside down so the water can't get in there and freeze and burst the barrel. Um, Cause you're right, you don't wanna have um, water in your, in your barrel. And even if you have snow, you know, and it melts and then it gets cold again, you can, you can burst your rain barrel. And then I just put that downspout um, back together for the winter so that uh, melting snow goes down into the drain tile. So that's what I do with mine. Excellent, thank you. Lisa said, thank you so much, Patty, very informative. And um, just going to echo that. Thank you so much for all the information you share. This is great. And um, I know you'll uh, share the handout with me and I will get that to everyone who's attended tonight. So thank you very, very much. Yes, and one more thing that I forgot sure. to say while I was talking is um, there's a local seed company called Fruition Seeds down in Naples, and on their website, they have a lot of information that's free information about, and because they're a seed company, it's primarily about annual, you know, veggies and flowers. Um, so they have a lot of information uh, that's free about when to plant and uh, uh, when to plant things, um, companion planting tons of free information on their website at fruitionseeds.com. So, you know. What is it again, please? And I'll put it in the chat. Yeah, fruition. Fruition seeds. Okay. Seeds.com. Great resource for home gardeners. Lots of free things. They also do webinars that you can attend. Um, and uh, they're uh, just a fabulous uh, group of people who are bringing a lot of really useful information to home gardeners so that we can you know, all be more successful with what we're trying to grow. Thank you so much, Amy. Thanks everybody for taking time to be here tonight. And, um, and I hope this was really helpful and useful to you. And um, I look forward to uh, hopefully having another conversation with you at another time. Definitely. Yes. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for logging in tonight. Um, this program will be available on our YouTube channel um, probably next week. If you'd like to review any of the information that Patty shared with us tonight. All right. All right. So thank you again. And I will close the meeting. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye. Good night.